Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our second webinar in our Back to School webinar series. Today's webinar will focus on financial wellness and basic need resources that practitioners, practitioners can use to help students and their families. My name is Ade Bukola. I work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, section for students and young consumers as an outreach specialist. Within our section, we focus on creating tools and resources to help students and their families make more informed financial decisions about paying for college, managing money, and repaying student debt. During today's presentation, we ask that you use the chat feature for your questions and comments. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, and we will try to address as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. Before we get into it, I will read our CFPB disclaimer. This webinar is being facilitated by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It is intended to provide information about student loans. The topics discussed do not represent bureau policy positions. Any opinions or views stated by presenter are the presenter's own and may not represent the bureau's views. Nothing said in this webinar by a bureau representative constitutes legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the bureau. A brief overview of today's presentation. Our speakers will discuss implementing financial wellness practices into your programs, and we will hear about some of the great work that's being done at the SHARE Center at Palo Alto College to help students with their financial wellness and basic needs. Then we will learn about some state-administered grants and scholarships. We have three great speakers lined up for you all. Our first speaker today is the financial coach and financial health counselor at Branches City, Florida, Nidia Alvarez. Then you all will hear from Delilah Marquez and Kiana Pena. Delilah is the Director of Student Advocacy, and Kiana is the Senior Financial Literacy Advisor at the SHARE Center at Palo Alto College. And our third presenter, Dr. Melissa Cruz, she is the Vice President of Customer Communications at the Georgia Student Finance Commission. They all have a lot of great resources to share with us, so I will turn things over to our first speaker, Nydia Alvarez. Welcome, Nydia. Thank you so much. My name is Nydia Alvarez. I work with branches in Miami, Florida. And so just uh, to give you a little background about me, um, I work as a financial coach and a financial health counselor. Um, and I work uh, with uh, families, um, specifically in uh, Florida City which is in South Miami-Dade County. Um, and so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what Branches does regarding financial wellness um, and how those things can be implemented in, in your programs to be able uh, to give more resources and more opportunities to the students um, and the families that you serve. And so let's begin. So Branches, our mission is to provide life-changing opportunities to help working families and their children break the cycle of generational poverty. And so here we have an example of a family of one of our recent graduates. Um, she graduated Coral Reef High School in 2019, and she graduated in the top 5% of her class with a GPA of a 5.03. And so we're proud to support children and youth um, from kindergarten through college. Uh, we do have a 94% retention rate from year to year at our program. Um, and even when the student goes off to college. And the way we continue to support the student is by providing um, $2,500 per school year for incidentals, laundry, and just other things that the student may need while they're in college and their families may, may not make enough money or just may not be able to provide like a monthly um, stipend for the student for them to, uh, for their incidentals. And so that's where Branches steps in. So here we see Danielle and her parents um, who you know are a success story for us, a recent success story, and Danielle was accepted into Yale 
Uh, she was at Branches um, since she was eight years old, and you know we have been working with her family, not only her, in order um, to create long-term sustainability, financial sustainability for them, um, and to be able to help them. So this is just an example of what you know what our results are and what we do here is we just want to provide these life-changing opportunities because otherwise, you know, uh, Danielle and her family would not be able to afford for her to go to Yale when it comes to the tuition and things and things like that. But with the support of branches um, in our after-school program, we were able to support her through uh, her academics and even beyond. And so the way, the way we do this is we have three uh, main programs at Branches. We have the Grow, Climb, and Achieve. And so the Grow program serves elementary students. The Climb program serves middle and high school students. And then the Achieve program targets the well-being of the entire community through uh, fostering financial wellness and long term success. And so me particularly, um, I work under the ACHIEVE program with financial wellness, and then we kind of intertwine all of our financial wellness into our Grow and Climb program, which are enrichment programs that provide, that provide tutoring um, and provide support for our students academically. And so I think this is really an important part of the work that we do. And so just to kind of give you a little background information, we didn't always think about uh, data collection in the way that we think about it now. Um, and so data collection really drives, we're a data-driven organization. It really drives the work that, that we do. And I think that's very important um, when you're working with families and students, depending on, you know, what area of the U.S. and how your community looks, it's important that, you know, we, we collect data. And so um, traditionally, when we first started these programs, you know, we would collect data just, you know, the traditional way, but with our, the community that we serve, um, it wasn't really working out so well. And so we knew that our people needed help, but there was just a little disconnect between uh, the things that we knew they needed and kind of how to express that, you know, to be able to, to, to help them. And so our data collection um, is a great part of the work that we do at Branches. And so we've been able to come up with um, doing some paperless intake and even paperless uh, collection processes because some of our families, unfortunately, um, they've you know, immigrated to the U.S. and a lot of them have language barriers, um, even barriers when it comes to reading or writing. And so how could we, how we were thinking of how could we collect information to better serve our participants, and so um, our, our data collection um, took a shift a few years ago, and now we have participant-guided data. For example, one of the things when we do like family workshops um, is like pre and post tests by, for example, raise of hands. Unfortunately, some of our parents don't have the the writing or reading capabilities to be able to take a written survey. And so this is one of the things that has really driven our work, and it's important for practitioners to know that data really does equal money. And so if you have a good way of collecting data from your families and students, it could really shift the way that you serve them in, for, for, uh, in a positive way. And so with this data collection, we were also able to shift from a, a human services model to more of a human development model. And so we are very, very data-driven. Um, we have a very human-centered and holistic approach when it comes to financial wellness. And so here are some of the programs that Achieve offers specifically or financial wellness. And we take a, a two-generation approach, or we like to call it a two-gen approach, uh, to be able to serve families. And what this two-generation approach means is that, you know, we not only serve the students in that family, but we are also serving parents. So for example, we provide parents with personalized financial coaching. And so, again, if we're talking about having a human-centered and holistic approach, um, and, and we talk about seeing what the, where this person is at at the moment. Where is this family at? And what are the steps that they need to take to be able to, to have a long-term sustainability? And so this doesn't always look the same for every family for every family, to be honest with you. And so our approach is more tailored when it comes 
to the financial coaching, basically where this person is and what it means for them to be financially stable. And, and just to give you a small example of that, you know, for, for some of our families, financial stability just means having a reliable vehicle where they can get, you know, to work and back. For some of our students, um, financial stability uh, means being able to, you know, uh, also have, you know, a small vehicle to be able to get to work and help their parents in the household. So again, it looks different um, for, for everybody, but definitely we have a more tailored and personalized financial coaching model. Um, within that, we also do income tax return preparation. And so um, during uh, the tax season, um, and even before that, one of my jobs, um, apart from you know coaching students and, fam and families, is I also uh, work directly with um, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, which is a program for from the IRS where families uh, who earn less than sixty thousand uh, dollars generally can come and do their taxes in our offices for free. And so, if we're talking about student success and we're talking about students going to college, we all understand and we all can can agree on the fact that taxes is a huge part of that when they're doing their FAFSA applications and scholarships and things like that. And you know, we try to eliminate those barriers by having you know, this program available not only to our branches families, but also to the community as a whole. So we also provide uh, employment assistance. And so the employment assistance comes, um, we have someone from Career Source actually come to our center once a week and meet with uh, people who need an employment assistance that could be youth and also their parents and the families. Um, we also work on asset building, for example, preparation for home ownership. We also have a micro business coaching. So people who are either uh, wanting to start a business and this includes youth as well. You know, so sometimes we have youth uh, that have very entre entrepreneurial spirits and we wanna be able to foster that in them. And so we have micro business coaches to be able to help them to do that, um, to be able to instruct structure um, a, a, a program for them as well. So we also have our transportation program, which is another way we can eliminate barriers to financial success, where we help families uh, to be able to purchase affordable vehicles, to be able to get affordable car loans. Again, because in the area that we live in, in Miami, transportation is a huge thing for families and it's part of their financial wellness. And we also have an emergency services network, which basically helps families with uh, food, uh, shelter resources, and also um, helps them with like rent and utilities and things like that to be able to just get them over the hump for, for for a month, basically, for 30 days. And so I think this is really important. Um, we all know, right, the situation during COVID. And so uh, when when this happened, you know, we had to really transform our services um, and be creative um, to see how we were gonna help our, our community and, and not close down our doors. And so we actually were able to transform our services from a phase to face traditional type of coaching setting and helping setting. Um, and so as you see here, some of these pictures, um, in order to continue to fulfill and help people with their taxes, um, we uh, did like a little window there where people were able to come and um, the walk up window method, they were able to drop off their documents. Um, and that's on one of our sites and another one of our sites we were helping our participants right through the gate, practicing social distancing and being as safe as possible. But people in this time need, need as much help as possible. And so we were able to transform our services um, to be able to provide the same services, but just in a different in a different way and continue to support our students. So we uh, started our virtual coaching process. So we basically replaced our one-on-one -on -one coaching um, in person to financial coaching virtual model where we reached out to all participants, you know, we made available vid phone and video conferencing, you know, utilizing Zoom, Skype, Microsoft Teams, Ring Central, GoToWebinar, um, WhatsApp, uh, Google Voice. I mean, we were, pract were practically using many uh, ways to be able to get in contact with our participants, again, because if we're talking about a human-centered design, which is very important, then we need to see what works for our participants in order to reach out and meet them where they are. So these are some of the platforms that we've been using to reach out not only to families, but to students as well. 
And so one of the new things that we transitioned to right away that we really didn't have before um, was using virtual platforms to be able to connect with our students and our families. And so uh, one of the things that, that we recently acquired um, was the It's a Money Thing curriculum where students are able to just go on their own, um, be able, they can log in with like a password um, and they're able to see uh, the, the different um, um, It's a Money Thing videos. So it talks about income essentials, for our students who were um, getting ready to go to college, you know, we would, uh, they could see um, how to save on tuition, you know, all of these um, uh, webinar, or, or I would say a series of financial education videos designed to help our students and our children learn about money. And so, you know, this is something that they can do on their own and then we would follow up with a financial coaching session, helping them to put their budgets together before they went off to school and things like this. Um, we also started like a little um, YouTube series as well that kids and their families and students could watch on their own where, you know, the, our, our AmeriCorps students would uh, do like these little mini series of the Professor X Science Adventures and um, we did funny videos, but again, it's just changing the way we do things to be able to connect and bring these resources to the student and their families in a way where it was comfortable for them and in a way where they can access them at any time. And then our job would be to continue to follow up with them, um, making sure that all of their FAFSA stuff is filled out and, and that they're budgeting and making sure all their scholarships and everything were in order before they would either go off to college or maybe start their online classes as well. And so these are the different ways that we've been able to reach out to our families and transition from, you know, this face-to-face -face, um, interaction where we understand it's limited to be able to reach out to them in, in a way that was comfortable for them and in a way that they can literally see all of these things, you know, in, in, their, own, in their own time. So that's my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Delilah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, my name is Delilah Marquez and I am fortunate to serve as the Director of Advocacy at Palo Alto College in San Antonio, Texas. So together, Kiana, my colleague Kiana and I, we help lead support services and programming through our Student Health Advocacy Resource and Engagement Center. As you can see right there, it's better known as SHARE. It's a long acronym. And in today's presentation, we will highlight the background of our center, and then Kiana will go into more specifically about the financial wellness program that uh, does live in the SHARE Center and, of course, across to all of our students at Palo Alto College. In 2016, our institution was awarded a Title V uh, grant through the Department of Education, and uh, this grant encompassed an advocacy component that primarily allowed us to open the doors to our campus on-site food pantry as well as a career closet. And at the same time, the college was very strategic in developing an advocacy task force that uh, really had a mission and a vision to provide services to students way beyond just food insecurity and clothing insecurity and really focusing on those experiences outside of the classroom that students faced. And of course, this is all in efforts to just ensure that our students maintain enrollment, uh, they are persisting in class, and ultimately they're completing their educational program with us. So the purpose of the SHARE Center is to provide the students those advocacy services that support those performing indicators. The table that you see here, if we fast forward just a few years, the table that you see here is um, a list of our core services that we do have in our advocacy center. And as we grew within the four years, you know, the institution recognized that nationally, statistics were telling us 
that food insecurity and housing insecurity were increasing among college students. So what this did is this allowed our Alamo College District that was very determined to develop supportive services beyond, that, beyond those two services. And so um, our district, the Alamo College District, and let me just give you a little history of that. Our district is made up of five colleges throughout the city of San Antonio, and they are strategically placed around the map. And so with the, that initiative of our district, we are very proud to say currently this year that we now have a student advocacy center that is opened with the director of advocacy at each of the five campuses under our district umbrella. And so we are very proud of that because we know that as these challenges outside of the class continue to increase, then we are very hopeful and very diligent that our program of providing these core services as well increase so that our students can benefit from these services. This next slide here is the process of our advocacy services. So when a student will come into the center and they are either referred by a faculty or a student or they are uh, they come in, uh, you know, they're, they're self-requesting services. But if you notice, there are three tiers of assistance. The intake process, where a student will come in, request services, and initial intake will be conducted, and they're processed through. And if you can see, an immediate service is maybe a, a student who may be looking for the student conduct office, looking for a community agency and we need to refer out or perhaps they're coming into our center looking for an academic advisor. But in essence, if a student is coming to us for a request of specific advocacy services, then that student and our services will, you can look down towards the second tier level and that's a 30, 60 day plan. This is where case management begins with our advocacy team and the student. And really what this helps is it helps identify the situation of where the student is struggling and what services we know that we need to help put into action so that we can case manage the student throughout their term of 30 and 60 days. Extensively moving into the third tier, which is the 90 days or completion, whichever one comes first for the student. And again, completion can mean when the student decides that they have completed services and they feel, um, they feel as if they've received enough services and they're capable of moving on, or that can also mean at the end of the semester or graduation for them. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kiana, my colleague, and she will take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. As Delilah mentioned, my name is Kiana Pina, and I am the Financial Literacy Advisor at Palo Alto College, and I am currently housed in the SHARE Center, which is the Advocacy Center at PAC. I do want to start by giving you an overview of our financial wellness program. And one of the main things to know about this program is that this the entire program provides our students with both financial education and financial assistance offered at multiple touch points throughout their academic journey with us. And this financial wellness program also includes student learning outcomes to ensure that our students are demonstrating knowledge around three main areas of money management, which are responsible borrowing, budgeting, and credit. Now, in order to ensure that our students are being offered financial literacy curriculums, we do offer workshop series, and these workshops are facilitated in and outside of the classroom to ensure that we're meeting our students where they are at. Now, in addition to that, we also offer online resources for students to learn more about their personal finances. And this ranges from online self-paced modules, which they can find through iGrad. They can also schedule virtual financial coaching sessions, which are free, customized, and confidential. 
And we also offer a financial literacy syllabus that provides our students with a guide on how to navigate our program throughout their academic stay with us. Now, in addition to the financial literacy component, we also offer emergency aid, which is short-term financial assistance, which is accompanied by the 30, 60, 90 day case management that Delilah had previously mentioned. Now, as a holistic approach through the financial wellness program, the SHARE Center builds collaborative relationships with our EDUC 1300 faculty members. Now, the EDUC 1300 course is a required course that every single incoming student needs to take. It's that a foundation course where they learn how to be successful in college. And so since all of our students are required to go through that course, we decided to build partnerships with those faculty members to really introduce the program to them from the very beginning. Now, given that our financial wellness program is decentralized and it is not connected to an actual course, we wanted to ensure that we were meeting our students where they were at, which is primarily in the classroom. Now, this slide here is meant to provide you with a visual of the data on how we assess student learning outcomes. And so from fall 2018 to fall 2019, 2,054 students engaged in financial literacy workshops. Now, again, these workshops were predominantly facilitated in the EDUC 1300 classroom, and all of our workshops were one hour and 15 minutes. We chose to assess knowledge gained by conducting pre and post surveys, and so students were required to complete a pre-survey before the workshop began, and then a post-survey immediately after the session ended. And these graphs here are meant to give you some insight on the impact that these brief workshops had on our students and their understanding of personal finances. And so on the chart, on the graphs here, you can see some of the questions we asked our students. There were more questions than the ones you see here, but this is just like a brief insight. And it is, it's very interesting to see that a lot of our students do understand the importance of certain financial aspects, but they lack the knowledge on how to actively apply certain things in their life. And so as you can see, when we asked our students if they understood why it was important to follow a budget, from the pre-survey to the post-survey, there was not a lot of knowledge gained because they understood the importance of it. Now, when we asked them if they understood how to actually create a budget sheet, that's where you see more knowledge gained because although they understood the importance of it, they didn't have the skill set to actively apply that into their lives. And same thing goes with credit. When we asked them if they understood why it's important to have a good credit score, a majority of them understood that. But when we asked them if they understood what a credit score was and what encompassed a credit score, that's where you saw a majority of the knowledge gained. And so it's very interesting to see that just in a matter of one hour and 15 minutes, our students were able to gain knowledge and skills that they could actively apply into their life moving forward. Now, as part of our wraparound services, we provide our students with short-term financial assistance should they ever find themselves in a financial crisis. And so this slide here is a reflection of students that were awarded in fall 2018 and fall 2019. Of course, this was prior to COVID-19, and at the moment, our primary funding source was through Trellis Company, uh, which receives funding through the Department of Education. Now, of course, as you can imagine, as a result of the pandemic, there has been an influx of emergency aid needed, but lucky for us, the um, across the board, the Alamo Colleges has also seen an influx of funding sources, which has really allowed us to better assist our students. And so if you look over to the right on the charts, you can see that 90% of the recipients from fall 2018 persisted, and 88% of our recipients from fall 2019 persisted. And persistence can either be that the student enrolls into the uh, upcoming semester, or they transferred out to a four-year institution. And so across the board, whether this was prior to COVID or during the pandemic at the moment, the top three requests from our students are for housing, whether that's rent or mortgage assistance, utilities, which is water, gas, or light, 
and even personal auto expenses, which may be a monthly car payment, car insurance, or even car repair. Now, the main purpose of the SHARE Center, which is the Advocacy Center, is to increase the chance for our student population to persist and complete, and ultimately to obtain a credential. And so we really understand that outside of school, life happens, and our services are meant to support our students, so they never find themselves in a situation where they need to consider dropping out. And so this here is the Advocacy Dashboard, and this dashboard was created to reflect the type of services the SHARE Center offers, the number of students utilizing each service, and it also gives you a comparison of productive grade rate and completion rate among students that receive advocacy services versus those that do not. So as you can see here, our advocacy recipients have a higher PGR and completion rate in comparison to their counterpart. And if you look over to the left, you will see that the financial wellness program is one of the top three services that our students are currently utilizing. Now I will be talking to you about the Don't Cancel That Class initiative. This initiative was launched in tandem with our faculty members. And this initiative is a really good example of the SHARE Center's innovative strategies to provide an enhanced learning experience to our students. Now, this initiative allows our faculty members to engage in professional development opportunities without having to cancel their class. While, um, while the faculty member engages in professional development, students are offered education and skills beyond their course material. And so through this initiative, it would not be uncommon to see a financial literacy workshop being facilitated in courses such as English, speech, sociology, and even history. Now, the idea of this initiative is that if a faculty member knows in advance that they will be out due to professional development or even for personal reasons, they can submit a request through the SHARE Center and they can request that one of our staff members substitutes for them and takes over the class. Now, not only are they requesting that one of our staff members substitutes for their class, they also have the autonomy to decide what they want their class session to look like. And so if you look um, on the bottom where it says pick from our menu topics, faculty have the ability to ask that the facilitator conduct an entire workshop around financial literacy, career services, general campus engagement, and even sexual and reproductive health. Now, this really, this entire initiative has really allowed the SHARE Center to not only support student empowerment, but employee empowerment as well since fall of 2019. This here is a workshop menu. The menu that you're looking at is very specific to the financial literacy workshops. And the purpose of this menu is to really create better communication between the faculty member and the advocacy staff members. And it also, uh, it also gives the faculty members the autonomy to decide what they want their classroom session to look like whether they will be present in the classroom or not. And so as you can see here, the menu is broken up by topic, time commitment, details, and purpose. And so it, again, is, it's meant to allow faculty members to just quickly decide what they want their session to look like. And so it's very simple. They can just, in the, in the event they wanted financial literacy, they would just let me know the day that they will be out and the times of their classes. And they would just let me know if they want option one, two, three, or four. The most commonly requested options are two and three. And so, for example, if a faculty member decided they wanted option three, that lets me know that during all of the class periods that need to be covered, I will be facilitating a workshop around Credit 101. Now, through the Don't Cancel That Class initiative, the financial literacy component of the financial wellness program was able to reach 355 students. And these students were reached through 16 courses that were requested by seven different faculty members.
And again, this initiative, the really great thing about this initiative is that it allowed us to expand our program beyond the EDUC 1300 courses that we had initially started off with. Now, moving forward in the classroom, we always hope to continue to expand our financial wellness program. We really hope to implement financial literacy into curriculum such as developmental math and even college algebra. Most importantly, we hope to continue to develop faculty partnerships to broaden the reach of students that maybe we would normally not get to interact with. And so we want to ensure that we are working with students that only take online classes or are maybe enrolled in community programs or even certificate programs. And ultimately, we do hope to continue to sustain this programming even once our um, Project Inboxo grant is over. Now, the last thing that I do want to mention is um, this graph here, or this chart, excuse me. Um, it, it circles back to what Delilah had initially mentioned. Palo Alto is part of the Alamo Colleges District, which encompasses five sister colleges. And across the board, there are advocacy centers at each of them. And so this chart indicates what type of services are provided at each campus. And as you can see here, all five campuses provide most, if not all, of the services that range from financial literacy, food, shelter, clothing, mental health, physical health, access and equity, and expanded services. And so, again, this is just meant to give you some insight on the work that not only Palo Alto College is doing, but all five sister colleges as well. And that is all for my presentation. I do want to thank you for your time. And I will go ahead and pass this on to Melissa. Thank you. Okay, so as the earlier introduction, I'm Melissa Cruz and I work for the Georgia Student Finance Commission. So what we are is the state of Georgia single higher education finance agency. And what I'm going to do today is give you a little in-depth look into state administered scholarships and grants. Um, it's definitely a very complex process. So we wanted to dive in a little bit for you and hopefully you'll be able to use some of these navigation tools in your own state. Okay, so just as a quick reminder about financial aid types and sources, they come from lots of, they come in lots of different forms. So today we're specifically going to be talking about scholarships and grants that come from the state. We all know there are loans and work study programs um, that are federal based. Um, as well as specific scholarships that come from the colleges, whether it is academic uh, or sports performance, all of the different all of the different um, options. Private foundations, again, lots of different lots of different ones. But we're going to be specifically talking about uh, state aid. <clears throat> okay, um, and again, I have specifically listed. Georgia's examples of these, so you can look at your state to see what is an example in your area. So for a merit-based scholarship, that's what it's called here in Georgia. Again, as you can see down, I don't, I'm not going to read through every single one of these, but for example, if you have students that you're working with um, that you know fall into the merit-based and need-based, um, again, maybe they can they can qualify for several different ones. And of course, the Pell Grant is federal. I know that, 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 that's not just specific to Georgia. Um, <clears throat> we also provide, um, through the Georgia Student Finance Commission, we have a website where the student can log on. A parent can also create an account as well um, and have access to their student account. The student can search for scholarships. Uh, we do pay. Um, a yearly fee to have outside scholarship examples. Um, so we don't just provide resources just for the state scholarships and grants. And again, everything from height, ethnicity, um, to unique characteristics of you or your student, um, we will assist you with finding additional scholarships <clears throat> based on those traits. 
So specifically to the state of Georgia, our um, state aid, our state scholarship is funded by the Georgia Lottery. Um, and so with that comes a lot of uh, legal <laughs> uh, definitions of different types of programs that are available to a student. Um, so again, that's kind of a, a high level overview of the different types of scholarships and grants um, that is funded through the state of Georgia from our lottery system. This is just a, this is not a, a full look, but again, this is just kind of an example of other states um, that do have lottery funded scholarships. We in the state of Georgia, again, because our state program is fully funded by the lottery, we do continuously look at other states and what they're doing, uh, the amount that they're providing, the percentage towards the programs, um, just to kind of continuously give us a, a a benchmark as to what we're doing here in the state of Georgia versus some of the other states. Um, funding for Georgia specifically, again, we have just this past year, we serviced over 240,000 students in the Georgia Student Finance Commission. Um, of those, uh, it totaled this year specifically uh, 880, just a little bit over $888 million. And again, those uh, tabs that you're seeing there are the different types of scholarships and grants that are covered. What I'd like to really highlight about these different scholarships um, and something that is not as well known is the fact that depending on the student and depending on the school that they choose within the state of Georgia, that HOPE scholarship, which is the top scholarship, can cover different percentage amounts of the tuition. Unfortunately, um, folks know about the HOPE scholarship and they think, oh, if my student gets this HOPE scholarship, I'm going to get 100% of tuition. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And that's why we have created um, the GA Futures website so students can log in and create an account and they can see exactly what they qualify for. We receive all high school transcripts, all college transcripts, as well as the FAFSA, um, and as well as all test scores for students who have submitted to us. So we have a unique situation for us in Georgia where we at GSFC can see all of these different um, pieces of the puzzle for the student. We can see what your high school GPA is. We can see what your recalculated GPA, for example, um, if a certain school wants to pull out sciences and maths in certain areas that they're looking for, we can assist with that. Um, we can assist with recalculating the GPA based on the state aid that you're eligible for. So the student will log in and create an account and we will link together all those different pieces. So again, the FAFSA, so that tells us what type of federal aid they're eligible for, what type of state aid they're eligible for based on their transcripts, in addition to that, what type of merit aid they're eligible for based on their testing scores. Um, and then again, if they've already transitioned into college, we can tell them what they're eligible for at that point. Um, and back to talking about the HOPE scholarship, just as an example. So for example, Susie Smith, we're gonna use as a name. Now she could have, she's a unique individual. She obviously only has one GPA, she has one test score. But depending on the different colleges she chooses just within the state of Georgia, that HOPE scholarship can cover 100% of tuition at one school. It could cover 80% of tuition at another school or 20% of tuition at an additional third school that's eligible to receive that aid. So unfortunately, due to that complexity, that's where we really try to use our outreach team um, that I'll talk about in just a second to sit down one-on-one -on -one with all those students to talk to them. Last year, we were proud that we physically met with 110,799 students um, in the state of Georgia to assist them with this process because as you can hear from all these different statistics that I'm spouting out, it is quite complicated. <clears throat> So maintaining the HOPE scholarship, again, this is just an example, is also complicated for the student. Um, this is, I'm sure, similar in other areas. And so this is always something that we want to talk to the student about. At the end of every semester, um, as you can see, 
the end of every spring semester, excuse me, uh, especially once they've reached uh, a certain level, their, their GPA is recalculated at each of those checkpoints to continue to monitor their ability to receive the scholarship. So that's part of our financial literacy that once you've got, once you've received the scholarship, again, it's part of that process of maintaining your academic standards uh, throughout high school as well as um, <clears throat> college so that you can continue to receive your scholarship. We try to counsel them about what happens if you lose it. Um, fortunately, um, there is a way to gain it back. Um, however, there are several instances where, you know, two strikes and you're out. Um, so that's also why we, in conjunction with financial literacy, um, we also want to make sure that they're constantly in, in contact with um, other resources, especially the ones that were mentioned by uh, the previous speakers um, of not only financial literacy, but study skill habits, you know, all of the above. Um, in addition to that, we also have kind of a, a, a group of students that don't necessarily understand their eligibility. Um, if they fail to use the funds within 10 years of graduating from high school, obviously with the caveat of the exception of active military, what are they then eligible for? We have a lot of students that right after high school, for whatever reason, maybe they decided not to transition into any type of higher education, whether it's two-year, four-year, or a certificate program. Um, but five years later, they think, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe I want to go to college, and then they're not as familiar with what they're eligible for. So we do have a secondary program for that um, that, we're, that we do reach out to students and um, especially if a student reaches back out to their high school um, to ask them questions, we're constantly there trying to assist them with that. <clears throat> so just because the student um, graduated from high school and didn't go straight into college does not mean that they're not eligible for state aid. The other side of the um, of the programs that are, again, are not as well published are our career grants. So these are for students um, and adults who have decided that they don't want to go straight into a four-year program or even do a four-year program at all. Um, and these are going to be specific uh, careers um, that have been deemed ne needed um, in the state of Georgia. So the state of Georgia has been um, allow GSFC to provide funding for folks to go into these programs and get uh, two-year degrees as well as certificates. Again, not going to read through all of these, but as you can see, we have quite a few other state programs that are going to be very specific uh, to different demographics uh, within our state. Uh, I do want to point out that our REACH scholarship uh, that we have there, that one is uh, need-based, um, so that is the one one of the need-based programs that we do have here in the state of Georgia. Just as a reminder, we, we all know this, um, but as far as past the completion, the class of 2024 Georgia, we are currently ranked 13th in the nation, um, and so we do use that kind of as, a, again, as another benchmark um, with everything that's going on. We do, we still have seen a year over year improvement. So we are fifth in the nation for that. However, we have had a decrease in the number of seniors that have completed the FAFSA, um, whereas the national average is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, negative 4.1%. Um, I do have a link on there. I'm not gonna click on that, but I, from what I understand, the presentation will be provided. Um, so you can definitely look on that. That gives you detailed information all the way down to um, your county district level um, for your different school systems if you're looking to see um, any of that type of data. As far as GSFC, we do provide this extremely detailed data to the high school. So it is, it is private information, so it's not, you, you would not be able to log in uh, to GSFC and see it. However, the high school administrators uh, would be able to go in and see um, if the student has authorized it so that the high school counselor can view their FAFSA information as well as be able to assist them uh, if, say, for example, they were asked for verification of their FAFSA, again, that's another um, 
that's another service that we provide uh, to the counselors within the state, as well as to the students and the parents within the state um, that we assist them with completing their FAFSA. Back to the outreach services, um, I wanted to, yeah, I had the, I thought, um, I had the map on there. So we do cover, as you can see, the entire state of Georgia. We're, uh, we do have representatives physically located in all of that, all of those different areas. Um, obviously right now they are doing everything online. So we were fortunate enough that beginning about a year and a half ago, we had transitioned into offering a lot of our services online via webinars um, and one-on-one -on -one sessions with students and parents. Um, so now we have been able to transition smoothly into that. We are accepting um, we are accepting reservations through the next several months for uh, group work as well as individual sessions. So each of those counselors have been highly, highly trained in everything financial, everything from financial literacy all the way through, again, assisting them with while they're in college. <clears throat> so those those folks used to travel um, all over the state. However, we have uh, we've transitioned to online currently, and hope we're hoping that we'll go back to being able to travel one on one. If if not in the spring, then maybe into the summer or fall of next year. And going back to this, okay, um, we do provide online training for. K-12 administrators, teachers, and counselors. We also do provide online training for any other um, community organizations, faith-based organizations. We have a robust pro partnership with our library systems, especially over the summers. Um, the libraries did provide um, free Wi-Fi for students um, from the, their parking lots, uh, especially in a lot of rural Georgia areas. We run into a lot of access to um, internet issues. <clears throat> so if a student, you know, a student can't even create an account or fill out the FAFSA or interact with their with their representative, if obviously they don't even have access to the to the internet. Um, so we have partnered with libraries on that. So we've been pretty successful. This especially this summer, from spring all the way through now, um, with partner with our library system. Another caveat, um, we do have a lot of online one-on-one -on -one sessions with our students. Um, and with that, again, depending on their situation, we found uh, we were hearing from other, other folks that they might have been reluctant to to do those video sessions. Um, and so we've actually been providing them with fun backgrounds, virtual backgrounds that they can put up for their session. So everything from providing them with fun, interactive um, things for them to do to learn more about how they can navigate through GE Futures um, to providing them again with, you know, we have virtual backgrounds with cats on them and things like that, um, that, that, that we try to, we try to, uh, assist them any way we can. Um, that is a very quick run through of, of everything that is GSFC. Um, again, we try to assist students to the best of our abilities. Um, we try to provide them with that ability to compare um, all of their options. Um, so again, with being able to see their financial aid, what they qualify for, see their high school transcripts, um, see their test scores, um, and see everything like that. Obviously, beyond what the college itself would give them, we can provide them with a high-level overview of what they would be qualified for, not only with federal aid, um, but also with state aid, so that they can make a good choice um, and, and see, again, see what all their options are. So that's all I have. I'm more than welcome. I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions. Um, that you have specific to Georgia. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for today. Before we wrap, I just want to highlight some of our CFPB resources. This slide will be available when you upload the webinar, so you will be able to uh, copy and paste the links for this website into your browser and visit our resources online. 
Again, thank you all to, to all of our wonderful speakers for all of the information you shared today. Um, before we open it up for questions, I just want to mention that if you're wondering how you can get a copy of today's presentation, we will have it available on our website in a few weeks. Uh, our website, again, is consumerfinance.gov. And you can also contact us via email if you want to receive additional information about this webinar. Our email address is students at cfpb.gov. And it's here for you as well on this slide. All right, so let me check the chat and see if we have any questions. Um, again, if you want to drop a question in, in the chat room, uh, you should see the chat feature on the right side of your screen. If you just click on it, it will allow you to uh, type any questions in our chat room. And I'm not showing currently any questions, um, but we'll give a moment or so for people to um, find that chat, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop the questions in our chat room. Okay. Um, all right, I am not showing any questions. Um, but if you do think of a question that you have for any of our speakers today, um, you can feel free to send it to us at students at cfpb.gov, and we will make sure that your question gets to the right speakers and uh, that we're able to get you an answer as soon as possible. Um, again, this presentation will be available on our website within a few weeks, so uh, feel free to check that. All right, still not showing any questions, so I will conclude today's presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.